This is the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, Episode 4. You're listening to the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, the number one resource for running a profitable home recording studio. Now your hosts, Brian Hood and Chris Graham. Hello, and welcome back to the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast. I know it's been a minute. We had kind of that planned gap after episode three while we kind of got things together, got some feedback from the listeners, and wow, we got a lot of good feedback from people. Chris and I were absolutely overwhelmed with all of you who emailed us with your feedback. Uh, We had a lot of great critical feedback. We had a lot of great positive feedback. Damn, we are motivated. Chris and I are absolutely motivated now, and we are stoked to get you some more episodes. So we've got three in the bank right now as far as uh, they're all recorded and edited. And all I've got to do is record some intros and outros. So expect to hear uh, a good consistent flow of episodes week to week right now. Instead of going straight to guests, which we do have a great list of guests that we plan to contact and interview. Instead of going straight to guests, Chris and I decided that we wanted to kind of cover some topics first. There's some topics that we think are really going to be beneficial to you as a budding home studio owner or even an established home studio owner that's already making money. We think that these topics that we touch on in these next few episodes are going to be beneficial to you. And as we kind of get ahead of the curve on our production schedule, meaning we have a good number of episodes, quote unquote, in the bank, meaning we don't have to be on this constant treadmill of getting episodes out, we'll start looking at getting some interviews scheduled. So keep an eye out. If you're part of the Six Figure Home Studio mailing list, you'll get notifications when we have new interviews that go live and all this stuff. But if you're a podcast subscriber, of course, just check our feed every single week and there should be a new episode there from here on out. Now, there may be more plan gaps in the future. I can't predict the future. Who knows what's going to happen with me traveling or with Chris traveling, but we are absolutely committed to getting this podcast up and going and keeping up a regular flow of this. So before we get into today's topic, I want to talk about something that I've just released. It's something that I think would be helpful to some of you guys that are struggling with your rates, with setting your rates. It is a free rate sheet guide. It's just a four page PDF. It covers all sorts of different uh, services that you may offer for your studio. Uh, And it gives you price ranges for, I think it's nine different services and gives you ranges, whether you're a beginner an intermediate or an expert. It also gives you a guide on doing free work. For those of you that are still doing free work, uh, there's something in there that is the five rules of doing free work that I really think you should follow if you're doing free work at all right now. If you're not doing free work, but you're not getting paid work either, uh, that guide is probably going to be good for you because if you're too proud to do free work, you're probably not going to be able to get paid work. So if you want that rate sheet, you can just text home studio rates, all one word, home studio rates to 44222. That's if you're in the United States. And if not, you can just go to homestudiorates.com and sign up and I'll send you that rate sheet to your email address. So today's topic is all about getting reviews for your studio. And I know it seems like something that some people may think it's dumb. Some people may think it's really smart. It's something that I personally honestly never thought of. It's not something I ever tried to get for my studio. And it still worked out for me. And I do play the devil's advocate during this conversation just a little bit. But I really think that this episode will help a lot of you guys out. And I think Chris does a wonderful job explaining why reviews are so important, how to get reviews for your studio. But the number one benefit by far is something called social proof. And I don't think we really dive into what social proof is in this episode. Social proof is basically just a really nice way of saying herd mentality. You're part of the herd. You're just kind of going along with the crowd. And that's a great thing if you own a business. So if you're driving by a restaurant and there are zero people inside and you drive by another restaurant, and there's a line of people outside of the door, well, you're immediately going to assume that the food at that second restaurant is better. Whether you've ever tried it, whether you've ever read anything about it, just the sheer fact that there is a line of people outside of the door, your mind immediately assumes that that food is better. That is social proof. Now, social proof does not mean that one restaurant is better than the other, and having a bunch of reviews for your studio does not mean that your studio is better than someone else's. But when it comes to people making decisions of who they're going to give their money to, Social proof is an absolute necessity if you're trying to stand out. So if you're struggling to get people to come to you instead of your competitor, or you're struggling to convince people that you are a valid option to work with, consider listening to this episode, consider implementing what Chris teaches us in this episode, and see if it doesn't make a difference in your business. Let me pose a question to you, Brian Hood. Yes, yes, sir. Let's say your toilet is clogged. Happens all the time. Happens all the time. You've gone to Home Depot. You've done all the things. You've tried to fix it yourself. Alas, she won't budge. You get on Google and you are looking for a plumber. There's three plumbers that you find that are close to you. One, let's call it Bob's Plumbing, 
has 25 star reviews listed next to their search result in Google. Well, you got me there. I, I, I'm already intrigued. Indeed. Let's say Joe's Plumbing has two one star reviews. That's, that's a no, no to that guy for sure. And let's say Scott's Plumbing has no reviews. Mm. Who are you going to hire? You made this too easy for me, man. I, I did. I did. But there's a... I'm hiring Bob for sure. Bob, for sure. 20 reviews. You don't need to know anything else other than Bob has 25 star reviews. Now, I am going to read the reviews just to make sure they're not fake. Yeah. But almost always, you can trust some Google reviews to an extent. Indeed. So how does this apply to the six-figure home studio? Well, I don't know. I guess you're going to tell us. <laughs> I, I guess I probably should. So here's the thing. Um, we have gotten so many amazing responses, uh, emails from people, you know, in the previous episodes, we've been asking people to email us, give us some encouragement or some, some critiques, let us know what we could be doing better. And, um, you know, a couple people have told us a little bit about their studios and it's been, uh, it's just sort of been really, a, uh, apparent to me that this review episode is probably one of the most important things we need to do. One of the, one of the most common questions we get is how do I get more customers and, you know, typically when somebody asks me that, I ask them right away, well, what, what do your reviews look like on Google and Facebook and all that stuff? And I say, oh, I, I don't have any. And the thing you got to understand about reviews is no rational person hires anyone or buys anything without seeing those reviews first. When I get on Amazon, I love Amazon. I got the Amazon Prime thing. If I'm thinking about buying something for my home, I'll buy the thing with the highest ratings almost 100% of the time. That actually happened. That happened to me today, actually. I, uh, I was looking for a, an object on, on Amazon. I saw the very first thing that popped up when I searched. It had hundreds of five-star reviews. It was actually tagged with Amazon's choice. I didn't even look at the other options. That was, it was exactly what I needed. I didn't even consider anything else. I bought it immediately. They took my $15 and I was happy. It wasn't a toilet plunger, was it? No, it wasn't, but that, that would make total sense in this scenario. <laughs> well, that's my point. You know, if you're listening to this podcast and you're saying to yourself, I need more customers, I'm trying to run a profitable home studio, a great place to start is you need to know that right now, this very moment, people are searching for you on Google. That sounded so creepy. People are searching for the <laughs> service that you provide and the place that they're doing it is Google. You know, that's pretty much a guarantee. They're looking on Google and there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there. I want to record a song with my band. I want to record vocals for my project that I'm recording at home. I want, I need someone to help me mix my record. These people, when they type in mixing or recording studio, if you want more customers and they can't find you and they're the ones that are within a few miles of you, that's a problem. Super low-hanging fruit for most people that are probably listening to this podcast. So, um, that's the big thing you got to keep in mind. One, people will generally gravitate towards the business with the most quality reviews. They won't hire a business with bad reviews and they probably won't hire a business with, with no reviews. So Brian, when you see a business with no reviews, what do you think to yourself about that business? What snap judgments do you make? Then no one likes them. Yeah. Me too. That's that's it. Or it's not popular. There's no one. No one likes your restaurant or your service or whatever you do enough to take the time to leave you a review. And the only time I ever make an exception for this is if there's a new restaurant that just looks very promising. Yeah. And it's just brand new. And then I understand. Okay, they are brand new. That's the only exception I'll get. But if it's a year old restaurant or two year old restaurant or something that's been around for a while and they have no reviews, uh, I am not even going to give them a chance because there's too many other good places to try. I make a snap judgment. If I'm thinking about going to a restaurant, I see they have no reviews or I'm going to hire, you know, a plumber is a good example um, and they have no reviews. I make a snap judgment and say they probably don't take their business seriously and they probably won't take me seriously and I don't have any interest in working with them or buying what they're selling. So um, I'm making some pretty broad, intense blanket statements, and I'm sure not everyone thinks the same way that I do about reviews, but in my opinion, they are essential. Any sort of marketing activity that you do is multiplied by how your reviews look. So you could have all the reviews in the world, but if you don't, or all the marketing in the world, but if you don't have any reviews and someone starts to do research and finds out that you have no reviews, that, that's a big red flag, huge red flag. 
I want to go back and play the devil's advocate just a little bit, please, because you know I've I've been very successful in my studio, and I don't think I have any reviews on Google. I don't think I have any reviews on Facebook. So this is very much a Chris episode, mm. and that goes back to our different business models because I'm very much entrenched in a niche, and Chris has niched down by service. And so when you are differentiating by your service, well, the way you stand out as a service that you are are promoting or providing is you have to have some sort of social proof that separates you from everyone else or some sort of really any differentiating factor. But reviews are one of those differentiating factors. And if you have zero reviews, well, what is setting you apart from the guy down the road doing mastering? What is setting you apart from the other guy on the internet that I could send my songs to, to do mastering or to do mixing? And so when you're using services to differentiate your, or to niche down, you're niching down by service, it's, it's very, very difficult to stand out. And one of those ways to do it, which is the way that Chris is going to talk about today is by getting reviews. And that is what he has done to really uh, help launch his business into the stratosphere as far as income. Yeah, for sure. So here's the, the question for those of you that are listening that are saying, okay, I have a studio. I don't have any reviews. I'm convinced I need the reviews. I need people that are looking for a studio to see, wow, lots of people like my business. Maybe I'll like it too. Um, I've got a question for you. Let's say you have no reviews. What would happen if stuff went sideways with a client and they put a one-star review on your business and you didn't have any other reviews? Oh, hell no. Hell no. You're screwed. Yeah, you're done. You You are in some serious trouble there because here's the problem. You got to think about why people write a review. Angry people love writing reviews. Happy people, not as much. So it's way easy to get really bad reviews if you make anybody angry. It's very difficult to get good reviews for making people happy. And back to one of the things we talked about previously about adding value, about going beyond, above and beyond so that when people get done, they say, wow, that was worth every penny. This person's incredible. I'm going to tell all my friends. You have to leave your clients blown away if you want reviews. No indifferent client is going to give you a five-star review. Yeah, he was pretty good. He's a decent engineer. He's an okay studio. Mic selection was okay. I say that you, know, you have three types of customers. You have the happy customer, and they're going to go out of their way to, again, possibly review you. Uh, they're going to refer people to you. They're going to tell other friends. They're going to, you know, they're going to be your advocate for the rest of your life. And they're going to be a lifelong customer. That's what you want with every single person. Then you have the second type of customer or client, if you want to use that word. And that person is a neutral customer, or neutral client. And they're, you know, it was fine. It was worth about the $5 that I paid for that hamburger. Or it was okay. It was worth $150 I spent on that, on that mix or that, on this $50 I spent on that mastery. It was okay. It was fine. That person's never going to go out of their way to send you anyone. They're never going to leave you a review. They're never going to do, do anything for you other than you got the 50 bucks, you got the 150 bucks from them that one time, and they're probably not going to come back to you. But that you know, you can probably make a living doing that if that's the way you want to live your life, but it's really going to be difficult for you because you're not going to have that uh, compounding effect that you get from happy clients. But then we get down to the unhappy clients. And these people are toxic assets to your business. Yeah. They will absolutely wreck you and they will go out of their way to dog your business either on the internet or to their social circles, um, they can undo the work of 10 to 100 of happy customers that you have. So, you know, you want to do whatever you possibly can to never have a customer that hates you. Yeah. So, you know, with that, I I think it's important to understand, uh, we're going to say this again and again and again, this podcast ultimately is not about profitability, I would say. I, I think in order for it to be about profitability, it first and foremost has to be about making happy customers. If you don't have super happy customers, you will not be successful. There's this lie in our society that, you know, entrepreneurship and building a business is about ripping people off. It's about being sneaky and convincing them to pay way more than they should. I don't believe that lie at all. In my experience, success has come from blowing people's minds, from them saying, wow, this is so much better than I thought it was going to be. Wow, you took such great care of me. And as a result, I'm going to tell my friends. It's, it's almost, at least in my industry, as far as audio mastering goes, it's impossible to, to build a business off of working with each customer one time. Crazy. It's so hard. When they start telling all their friends and they keep coming back again and again and again, that's when the business starts to grow. So 
back to this question. What would happen if someone wrote a one-star review? You're, if you don't have any reviews, you're done. That brand is toast unless you can get a lot of five-star reviews quickly, which is hard. So the important concept to grasp here is that good reviews protect you against inevitable future bad reviews. You're going to someday drop the ball with a client or you're going to meet a crazy person with ridiculously crazy expectations and they're going to write a one-star review and you're going to be protected from them by all the happy customers you've had that have written five-star reviews for you before. So I know what you're thinking, but how do I get reviews? It's so tough. It's so awkward. You ask for them. Well, how do you, how do you ask for them, Chris? Let's talk about that. So um, here's the thing. When a customer says something to me, when they rant and rave, you know, I go, try, I try to go above and beyond when, when they rant and rave. Oh my gosh, these masters sound so much better than we ever dreamed they could. Then I say, wow, that's the response I'm looking for from every customer. Would you mind copying and pasting that into a Google or Facebook review? Here's the link. Is there a point in the process, your standard process for all of the projects that you work on? Is there a set time that you actually solicit some sort of feedback from the customer? Always, constantly. Well, when, is, when in the process is that? Is it you know a week after the project's done? Is it a day after the project's done? Is it when you send the files? When do you actually ask for the feedback? Well, I ask for feedback. I typically get the feedback without asking. Um, I would say about 30% of the time I don't get the feedback and I follow up within a week and just say, hey, I wanted to know what you thought of my work. Um, so that, that's the real big thing here is you're asking, when someone says something that you wish was a review, just ask them to turn it into a review. That's it. That's my whole secret. You know, what's funny is I just Googled Chris Graham Mastering and I see that you have 110 five-star reviews on Google uh, and you have 69 five-star reviews or 4.9 average. Sorry, you've dropped the ball at least once, Chris. One on time. Facebook, on Facebook, yeah. Um, so that you're, you're practicing what you preach. You've clearly done your work when it comes to, to getting your reviews on this. Yeah, and thank God, you know, the, the, on Facebook, there is one one-star review. I mean, it might be a two-star review, I don't know. And, you know, short story, it was a client who uh, hired um, one of my mix engineers. We offer mixing services as well. And hired one of my mix engineers. The client was losing his mind writing these, these emails back to my mix engineer. These are the best things I've ever heard. They, they lift me out of my seat. You know, he's dropping the F-bomb left and right with how excited he is. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he was like, these are the worst mixes I've ever heard. Ooh, like, bipolar. Like two months later. So he like wants a refund. He's already approved the mixes. And I was like, um, man, I know I'm going to get a bad review to this, but on principle alone, I, I can't like, I, I, the time has come and gone here. Yeah. You know, like you approved everything more enthusiastically than anyone had ever approved a mix in my experience. <laughs> and now you've changed your mind on principle. I, I can't, he tried to bribe me. He was like, if you don't give me a refund, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I was like, man, that stinks. And you know what? Because you had so many five-star reviews, you could just take it. Yeah. You could take it in stride. And we need to actually have an episode, Chris, if you want to write it down on your paper with your carpenter's pencil or whatever you, whatever archaic stuff you use. It's one of these cool blue and white French pencil pens with four different ink colors in it. I'm a big fan. Anyways. I think I had one of those when I was six years old. But anyways. So did I. That's why um, I have one today. Yeah. Write this episode down where we do an episode on uh, avoiding nightmare customers. It's just an entire episode we could devote to nightmare customers in general because yep. no matter what, you're going to experience those. But let's move on to, uh, to, to the next section of the outline here. Absolutely. So let's talk about what do reviews get you? Number one, Brian mentioned it before, social proof. So what is social proof? Social proof is essentially when, when you are considering doing something and you look around at everyone else and everyone else is saying, yeah, this thing is awesome. Let's do it. It's essentially peer pressure. It's everyone saying, wow, uh, the donuts at this donut shop are amazing. So you say, oh, wow, okay, I'll, I'll try that. If everyone around me is saying these donuts are good, I will do it. So when you get a bunch of reviews, you get social proof from other people that say, wow, your business is awesome. Um, and people use that when they're considering whether to hire you or not. It's a massive, massive tool that people use when they're deciding whether to hire someone or not. Number two, like I mentioned before, is reviews are a multiplier. Any marketing work that you do or any networking that you do, any anytime someone's thinking about hiring you and you put the work in to potentially win a customer, those reviews multiply your efforts and give you a way better chance at actually winning the sale. 
And here's the next thing. Google reviews um, and Facebook and Yelp to some degree as well improve your Google ranking. So the big thing there is you need to ask yourself, um, what does Google want? This is going to be a little bit of a rabbit trail, but what, what does Google want from you as a business owner? And the answer is they want to give people searching Google the answers they're looking for. Google is all about connecting people with questions to answers. And if you are a business that can solve a problem, how do I get my mixes to sound great? Or who can edit my vocals for me? If they go to Google and Google connects them with the right type of person, that's, they're like, wow, Google, way to go. Thank you so much. So Google wants to connect people with people who can solve their problem or answer their question. And they've, they've succeeded in that. If you look oh, at the word so Google, much. it's now a verb. I've Googled it. <laughs> yeah. It is now an action we take. And it's, it's, it's advice you give someone. It's like, just Google it. <laughs> yeah. So I think case in point, let's say you live in a town in the middle of Wisconsin. And, you know, let's say it's a medium sized town with 50,000 people and there's three recording studios. None of them have any reviews today. In six months, one of them has 25 reviews and one of them has two reviews and one of them has one review. Based on that alone, if you're Google... Which studio are you going to put at the, at the top of the search results? The one with 26 reviews. Absolutely. It's a no-brainer. So uh, when you get these reviews, they improve your ranking. They're super, super important. So how do we get them? You know, that's, I, I'm sure that's the thing you got. That's the, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? That's the million-dollar question. I'm going to say something kind of surprising uh, here, I think. And I think for most of us, our dream is to land big clients. If you can find a client that's going to pay your bills for a month or two, that's a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> when you have lots of big clients, two things happen, at least in regards to reviews. One, there's a lot of opportunity to get tired of you. If you are day in and day out working at the same studio, it's grueling. It's exhausting. And when the record drags on and on and on and on, this used to be my living, you know, I'd work for one guy for three months and we would work our butts off making a record and then we'd go to the next. This is when I, back when I was producing more than a decade ago and super intense. And then at the end of that, you know, three month process where you're working for that client nonstop, so, hey, would you mind giving me a Google review? That's really awkward. And two, you're only going to get, let's say you're working one month on each project. You're going to get 12 reviews per year. That stinks. So here's my advice on that. Small projects. Small projects where you massively over deliver. So the beauty of the small project is if you can get someone to come in, book a three hour, let's say you're a recording studio, book a three hour recording session and get them in and out and super over deliver. And they say, wow, that was so much fun. I'm so glad I recorded here. Wow. Would you mind putting that in a Google or Facebook review? I'll email you a link. If you do that 10 times in a row, you're going to get 10 five-star reviews because it's easy to, to over-deliver on smaller projects. And let me just kind of go off on um, my own little thing here is, again, this is very different from my business model where I am doing uh, a lot of those longer-term longer, longer -term projects. I will say uh, I'm doing mixing and mastering, which is a lot less of a project than it was when I was doing full tracking, editing, lodging, mixing, and mastering. Uh, but I do agree with Chris, especially if you're brand new at this, where especially if you're just trying to get a bunch of reviews. I know when I, uh, when I was trying to get a bunch of reviews on my Airbnb when I first started it, I was just doing minimum one night stay. I was far below the average value for this similar sized Airbnb in my area in Nashville. And I was just way over delivering on what they got for the money. And I was just booking things up as quickly as possible to get a bunch of five-star reviews. And within a month, I was a super host on Airbnb. And I know that you're like, why are you talking about Airbnb when we're talking about studios here? Well, the principle is the same. When you're just starting out, you have to get whatever, you have to take whatever you can get. And you have to be willing to lose a little bit on the short, short term in order to gain a lot of bit in the long term. So now my Airbnb is a top 10 gro highest, one of the top 10 highest grossing Airbnbs in Nashville, just one unit is one of the top 10 in Nashville. And that's because I was willing to lose a little bit of money. I left a, lot, a little bit of money on the table when I first started in order to become a super host and have that review base in place. And you can take that exact same thing for your studio and run with it. When you are struggling to find clients, when you're struggling to get people into the studio, when you're struggling to land that $5,000 album uh, 
that album deal that you're trying to pick up from that one local band who's going to blow up your share of it. Well, sure, try to get those if you can. But what you can start doing is start getting those smaller projects. Edit drums for some producer. Do a demo for a, you know, one song demo for a, a local band. Even if they're not the greatest band, you can start getting reviews under your belt and you can start getting people into your studio to start building those relationships that will help you flourish for the long run. Mm, solid. I'm trying to find a quote here. Um, <laughs> that Seth Godin quote? That Seth Godin, Godin quote, yeah. So I'm going to paraphrase it. Seth Godin, for those of you guys who don't know, is just about one of the best uh, small business slash marketing authors uh, of all time. He's spectacular. And I read one time, uh, I, don't, I don't remember if it was on his blog or one of his books, but he said, to start a small business, start with the smallest possible service you can provide that solves a problem your customers know they have. I think that was pretty close to the actual quote. Yeah, that's pretty good. But yeah, but what he was saying is solve small problems. I think, you know, I'm a lot of this podcast is me preaching at myself from 10 years ago. And my opinion of what I needed to do to start a business 10 years ago was uh, find a client and do everything for them. Uh, per, you know, help them write their songs, help them record their songs, uh, do all the engineering, do all the producing, do all the editing, do all the mixing, hire all the musicians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I did all these things and none of them very well. Yeah. And as a result, I didn't get any Google reviews, but I also turned out crap. My projects were nowhere near as good as they could have been if I had niched down and said, you know what, I'm going to hire someone else to edit or I am going to uh, hire someone else to record maybe some of these guitar parts. And that's because we're living in a world of specialization. It's like very much like the, the medical industry. If you've ever read the book, uh, the checklist manifesto, you ever read that Chris? Mm -hmm. I believe I told you about it. Yeah. That. You probably told me about it. Well, they talk about, <laughs> you know, how the medical industry used to be, you know, one person could handle it all and it's just gotten way too complex for that. And now you have a specialist for every tiny little detail of the surgery process or any kind of uh, we, every single wing of the hospital or every single whatever they call them. I don't know anything about hospitals, but I just do know from that book, you know, it's changed into a world of specialization. And so it's very much like that in the studio world. Now in the recording world, there are specialists for every single thing and every single one of them are better at you, uh, better than you at pretty much anything you do. So if you're going to start out somewhere, start out in one niche that you can really, really dominate and really learn the intricacies and all the ins and outs of it before you start to try to expand into other areas. Because uh, I've mentioned this, I don't know if it's on the podcast or just in general area videos and things I've done and, and uh, lessons I've taught other students. I know people here in Nashville that are making a full-time living just doing pitch correction for one niche. You know, there's the CCM niche or the country music niche. They're just doing pitch correction and that's all they're doing. They're just editing vocals for a living because they are the best at it and they've put all their systems into place and they've done all their connections in their, uh, in their, in their networks. They've built all their connections out to where they can bring more than enough work in to sustain a full-time career. And I want that for you guys. I want you to find that one thing that you're amazing at and dominate it. And then you can start worrying about how you can start stepping that up or making it more efficient or ramping up your income or maximizing it. But until you really learn to dominate one area, there's no way you are going to dominate all areas in all niches or all genres. It's just not possible. Yeah. I think if there's one thing you can take home from this podcast, it's that the, um, the jack of all trades is master of none. If you're wondering why you're not making any money and you as a studio owner or a producer or a mix engineer or you know what have you if you are doing everything you're probably not, you're not as good as you could be at one thing you know you look at back at history there's not a whole lot of generalists generalists being someone that was good at everything that really really rose to the top there's few exceptions to that ben franklin you know or leonardo da vinci but for the most part, you see people that were exceptional at one thing and they knew to focus on that. Einstein is a total, you know, he was a total uh, flighty, flaky, absent minded dude who incidentally had some real skill with trying to figure out the way the universe actually worked as far as physics go. He was really good at like one thing. He wasn't exceptionally good at other things. It, there, there was a documentary recently on TV where. Uh, his wife was talking about, you know, uh, his assistant will need to take care of all his money because Einstein didn't know how to, how to deal with money. It wasn't one of his skills. How fascinating is that? The dude that wrote the, the, M, the E equals MC squared, squared thing, you know, 
absolute genius, didn't know how to take care of his checkbook. It's not surprising, but because he niched down, he was able to be a real pro at that. So I think it's important to, to dabble. It's important to experiment in a lot of things and to find your passion, to find the thing that makes your heart beat. That's what I did. You know, I was a producer slash engineer slash touring musician slash mix engineer slash editor slash mastering engineer, but mastering really lit my fire. I got excited when I did that. And I could tell from my customers, it was the thing that got them the most excited too. So 10 years ago, you know, I dropped all my other projects and only focused on mastering. Thank God it went really well. So um, let's kind of bring this back home. Google reviews, super important. Um, Super duper important. Even if you haven't niched down yet, reviews of, of just someone saying, boy, he's great. His studio is great. That's still really valuable. Because yeah, when people search for your studio name, like when I typed in Chris Graham Mastering into Google, well, the first thing that pops up is the Google reviews on the right side. The second thing that pops up is, you know, you have your website at the top, then you have your Facebook page. And the Facebook page has all those reviews, all that social proof of people saying, hey, Chris is the shit. Go work with Chris because he's amazing. And if you have that sort of voice, that sort of power behind your brand or your studio, it is going to be so much easier to get people to pay you at the end of the day. Absolutely. So I think here's a challenge. Um, you know, what, what do you do next? What's an actionable here? The most important thing you can do, if you are wondering why your phone isn't ringing more, why more people aren't hiring you, is to pretend that you are someone else. Get on your computer and pretend that you are looking for the service you provide. First of all, see if you can find you. If you are uh, looking for a recording studio and you get on Google and you start searching for, you know, recording studio central Wisconsin or something like that, do you even show up? You should show up. That's important. A good way to do that is to start getting reviews. Um, if you haven't done it already, you do need to register your business with Google so that you actually have a business with an address. That's super important. That's, that's where the actual reviews live. And if you need to figure out how to do that, how do they do that, Chris? Just Google it. <laughs> Just Google it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So here's the big thing is you need to imagine you are someone else looking for you and see if you can find you on the internet. And then number two, once you've found your studio on the internet, you know, as you're doing this role play thing, would you hire them? Them being you. Are there red flags? You know, are you looking at, if, if you can really get outside of your own mind and look at the search results, is there another studio down the street with 25 reviews that are all five stars and you don't have any? Who would you hire? You know, uh, are there bad reviews? When you click on the link to get to your website, does your website communicate uh, what you actually do? You know, I, I think that's, that's really important. That's something for another day we can talk about more about um, how to make sure your website actually converts. So just to wrap this up, we're just saying, you know, when you finish a project, if you already have projects, hopefully at this point, when you finish a project, you know, if they don't go out of the way to tell you how happy they were, it's okay to ask. It's okay to say, hey, just check it in and see how you, you know, how you feel about the mix. Anything else we can do to make this better? Or are you happy with the way it sounds? Something like that. Just an a simple email or text or something like that. And what they get back from you is either going to A, help you improve your future work, hopefully, or B, it's going to be something that they can, you can then ask them to copy and paste into a Google review or a Facebook review. Uh, and at the very least, you can actually use it as a testimonial on your website, which is another form of social proof. You can also screenshot any of these reviews as social proof for your website. And again, um, let's kind of sum up what we talked about at the beginning. If you have no reviews on your business, you are one disgruntled customer away from losing your business. If you get a one-star review and you have no other reviews, you're done. App, time for a rebrand or a new career at that point. So that's really important. Uh, two, reviews are a multiplier. Um, that's a really important concept to take home with you. Whatever you do from a marketing standpoint, people are going to do some research. If they're thinking about spending some real money with you, they're going to want to see what other people think about you. And the place they do that is reviews. So get on your game, get you some reviews. It's awesome. It's also, once you kind of get this thing going, it's really fun. It's like one of the highlights of my day when someone's, you know, someone emails me back, yeah, man, just wrote you a review. Click over to Facebook or Google or whatever and see it and be like, whoa, oh my goodness. That's so encouraging. That gives me the fuel that I need to keep going and to keep, um, you know, trying to raise the bar with the quality that I'm giving my customers. And Brian, I think, brought up a great number three. One of the things uh, I think that holds people back um, to getting reviews is it's scary. 
it, what if you ask them, hey, what do you think of my work after you finish the record? And they say, mm, I wish I went with the other guy. That stinks, right? That absolutely assassinates who you are to you as a person. But it's the most valuable feedback you'll ever get for someone to say, I didn't like that you did this. Um, or eh, it was great, except that you just smelled terrible the whole time. <laughs> Or your toilet was overflowing. Why didn't you hire a plumber? <laughs> you know, like there's, there, there's a lot of great feedback you can get. So ask the question, what did you think to your customers? And when they say something great, ask for the review. When they say something bad, grow. So that is it for this episode of the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast. One quick tip based on this entire thing is that I need to kind of get a point across to you if you're trying to get a lot of reviews for your home studio. And that is to take as much friction away as possible. A lot of these areas like Facebook and Google, most people don't even know how to leave a review on those platforms. And it can be really, really difficult. So if you take some of the friction away for those people, you're going to have a much, much, much larger success rate when it comes to getting people to actually leave the reviews. So we practice what we preach here at the Six Figure Home Studio. And what we've done is make it as easy as humanly possible for you to leave us an iTunes review for this podcast. Most of you have probably never left a review. You probably don't even have a clue of how to leave a review. So to leave a review, all you need to do is take your phone out in your browser, go to the sixfigurehomestudio.com slash review. It'll prompt you and say, hey, is it okay if we open up iTunes? You hit okay. And then you hit the blue text there in the center of the screen that says write a review. So once you hit that blue text, all you have to do is leave a rating and a review or just a rating if you want. So as we get more and more reviews, it's going to get a lot easier for us to get really good guests on this show because a lot of guests, well, it's the same deal. It's social proof. They see that we have a lot of reviews. They think, hey, they have a lot of reviews. They must have a good fan base. Maybe I want to be on that podcast. So again, it's just like that restaurant analogy that I gave at the beginning of this podcast, which is they see the restaurant with no people in it, aka the podcast with no reviews. They don't want to associate themselves with that at all. And then they see the podcast with a lot of reviews, aka the, the restaurant with a lot of people outside of the door lined up for the food. And they just assume, hey, that's a great podcast or that's a great restaurant. I want to be a part of that. So by you taking the 20, 30 seconds to do the review, it really does help us out a lot. So thank you so much for doing that. And thank you so, so, so much for the people that have already left us review. We already have like 38 reviews on iTunes, which is great for only having three episodes posted. But our goal is to keep that train going. So if you can do that, awesome. That's the sixfigurehomestudio.com slash review. 